Welcome to our panel. We're all going to be quiet and it's the floor is yours. Okay, right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm going to talk to you about um, a series of books, two novels and a non-fiction book. And so I'm going to cover the first one very briefly. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but here's one we prepared earlier. We have a series of books about a pandemic, which was imagined by our author, Leslie Kelly. And the reason I'm telling you about it is that it's in a sense, imagining what it would be like if there were a pandemic which could not be cured, but would go on and on for many years. And how would the world cope with it so that too many people didn't die, in fact, people didn't die, but it was contained in some way. Um, she's written four books. As the series goes on, it becomes a bit more like a conspiracy thriller rather than just straight about a pandemic. Um, and what really sells it to me is her humour, her wit, and her very strong cast of characters. There are so far four books in the series. I'm just gonna leave that one there as something that if you want to know more about it, I can provide the information later. The first novel I'm gonna talk about is Dune Song by a Moroccan American woman, Anissa Bouzian. It starts off in New York at the time of 9-11. And she finds her main character, Jihan, is an Arab, a Muslim, and an American. And she finds that after 9-11, she is no longer welcome in the city where she's been living and working for years. So she goes to Morocco, uh, ostensibly to carry out some research for her PhD, but really to go back to base, go back to home country. Um, the, the overall theme of the novel is identity and home and where you belong and where you will manage to conduct your life in a way that is meaningful to you and, and to other people. The plot line uh, is to do with illegal transport of refugees and, and human trafficking um, and she uses that as the, the plot that gives you the action and the drama in it um, and it is a very dramatic book and what sold it to me was just the opening line which is I came to the Sahara to be buried and that drama and that dramatic scene where she is buried in the sand by Arab women um, as a cure for her illness is hugely powerful. And it has the most wonderful location, if you like, in New York and then the desert in Morocco. Um, Anissa is a remarkable woman, uh, an academic and a teacher who lives in France now um, and teaches there but there's a lot of her own experience of being a Muslim in the States that has gone into this novel uh, and her understanding uh, of how it feels. The next one I'm going to speak about is a novel we've not published yet. We're bringing it out next year. It's speculative fiction called The Actuality. This isn't actually the cover, um, which is a very brilliant orange and I can send that uh, an AI sheet later if anybody wants to see that. Uh, this is the, the proof copy that's gone out in, in some numbers, but we're publishing it next year. Uh, Evie, the main character, is a bioengineered human. She has, um, she, she is perfect in herself and she has been created to be the wife of a man whose real wife apparently died. Uh, so she looks and sounds exactly like the real wife, but of course she's not even human. And the whole novel really is about what it means to be human, because as you go on, you realize that in fact, Evie in some ways is far more human than some of the human beings in, in the novel and their, with their cruelties and their selfishness and their desperation for, for power. Uh, it's very fast paced. It has a really strong storyline. And it's one of those books that just moves on from one thing to another really fast. So it keeps you turning the pages as a dramatic story. And Evie is one of the, was one of only two of her kind left. They've now, the kind has now been outlawed. She has now been outlawed. And so she's being pursued. She will be destroyed once her husband has died and he dies near the beginning of the novel. So it's really a kind of chase movie, if you like. It's, it's a story that proceeds very, very fast. So that's that. But I am going to finish with nonfiction. And this book is called Stolen Lives. It's written by a journalist, Louise Holland, and it's about modern slavery and human trafficking in Britain now. It's a really powerful book. And I feel 
completely privileged to have been the editor. Louise is a wonderful journalist. She's a print journalist, but she's also worked on radio and television. And this is a very thorough investigation of what happens now in Britain in terms of modern slavery, uh, which covers many nationalities, many cultures, and it's right through our, our industries, if you like, in our towns and our cities. She writes about the county lines trafficking of young people, uh, drug trafficking. She writes about uh, how people are trafficked into this country and then find themselves enslaved. And she follows the story of one young Albanian woman all the way through from being enslaved and uh, being captured, if you like, right through to where she eventually um, gets leave to remain in this country. And that dramatic story forms a kind of thread right through stolen lives. Um, Louise interviewed charities, police, but also survivors whose voices aren't often heard so clearly as they are in, in this book. She looks at nail bars, cannabis farms, agriculture, you know, everywhere that, that modern slavery has been allowed to, to flourish, if you like, or the little pockets where it can be um, and keep going. So those are the books I wanted to tell you about. That's not out till September this year and we'll have a big publicity campaign for it. We've just sold the audio rights. Um, one other book, have I got a minute? I've got one minute to tell you about one more book. And I, I haven't got a picture of it or anything, but it's called Along the Amber Route. I don't have a copy at home. This is the trouble with working at home. I do not have the stack of books that I would normally have in the office. We we'll have some of them at home. I um, can't remember them all. Along the Amber Route is by Chris Schuler, and it's about um, traffic, it's showing where the route is for, for amber, this trade in amber that's gone on for millennia. Um, and it's history, it's trade, it's about war, it's about politics, um, but it's also about Chris's family and their involvement with, with the amber trade throughout the centuries. Um, it's really fascinating, it covers so many different things. And the route, the amber route, was from St. Petersburg to Venice, so you can see many locations involved in, in that one. So those are the books. Uh, which is a quick rattle through. If you have any questions in the last 30 seconds or whatever, <laughs> I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, that's can you, great. Can you remind me what the third book was um, about the bioengineered women? I just, I missed the It title. started with Health of Strangers series, then June Song, and then The Actuality, which is the speculative right. fiction. Right, yeah. But I can spend... quick question. I know yeah. you have a few minutes, seconds left. Do you focus in on finding stories that are about women and by women? It seems, it feels that way. Is we that don't. Your... Um, it I, doesn't I, happen that way. I've had a hard job picking books to talk to you about, and I could have picked another five that would have been completely different. So right. it's just how it happens to be. But we do have some very strong women's stories in our fiction, certainly. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask the Stolen Lives book you were talking about, did that have much about um, Scotland and slavery in Scotland in the it uh, exploration that, across the UK? There is some, yeah. 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 No, I think that's quite a, an interesting uh, topic, that, um, the reality of that that's not been deep dived into a lot yeah. in UK broadcasting. It's sometimes heightened in big dramas, but the fact that it's yeah. all been researched, well, it's quite interesting. Yeah, it's a thoroughly researched book. She really does. She's been working on this in one way or another, investigating it since 2010. So it's, she really knows her stuff. But I can send you eye sheets or books. If anybody thank wants. you very much. And for anyone who wants to continue the conversation or get in touch, we're really happy to connect people. Thank I'm happy for you to be in touch with me. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Hi, Adam. Hi there, Jessica, yeah? Yeah, it's Jessica. Welcome to um, Before the Shelf. I don't want to get in the way of your 10 minutes. So welcome to our panel and go for Hi, it. Yeah. Just go for it, yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's fine then. Right. Uh, right. Hi, my, my name's Adam Armit, and in the next 10 minutes, I plan to convince you that the graphic novel Corn's Quest is ripe for film. Um, first, I'd like to thank Expo North and the panel for actually allowing me to pitch today. Uh, it's a bit bizarre, mind you, with this COVID thing, but you know. Right, so in essence, the story about Corn's Quest is an epic supernatural drama that is embedded in Scottish folklore. It's about a young boy's perilous mission where he encounters mythical and magical creatures. 
at its heart, it's a tale of companionship, compassion, and courage. Although a young boy is a hero, gender is equally uh, represented because without his female friend, Ula, his quest would likely fail. What I'm going to do first though, is show you a little trailer that was made a few years ago, just to get a flavor of what we're talking about. That's how we can make it work on this, and it's a bit crazy, crazy way to do things. Sorry. Long, long ago, near the land of time, there lived a giant sea serpent called Mr. Stoolworm. It was so huge that when its head lay sleeping on a bank of sand, its tail curled right round the most northerly tip of Scotland. Okay, I'll stop that there. Um, so yeah, uh, so in Act One, uh, it's a super. It, it, as I say, it's a it's a festival. There's the start at it, the court jester is whole court in the field. There's bonfires around and so on. Uh, two characters are introduced, and the, the, in the in the tournament, it's Lord Alien, the captain, of the king's guard, a shrewd swordsman, and also Cattle. He's a, renowned for his enormous strength. Uh, but you'll learn in the story that he's fairy blood running through his veins. We also meet Corin and Ulla. Corin is, is a young 14-year-old hero, proud son of Lord Alien, and Ulla is the, his friend, strong world girlfriend, not girlfriend, but friend, girlfriend, and she's the daughter of Cattle. So back during the festivities, everyone's enjoying themselves but the celebrations are interrupted when a horseman arrives and wounded he falls from his horse. Nessa, Ulla's grandmother, a seer and medicine woman, revives the man. Nessa's going to play a vital role in the whole story. The revived rider has, sits up, has alarming news. Mr. Stoorworm is back. Now, Mr. Stoorworm is a giant sea serpent. Its sheer size and the fact that it breathes fire mean it's a dreaded creature. Lord Dalian had thought he had killed it many years before with his warriors, but clearly not. Next, the king's inner council decide a ship should be built and that their best warriors sail to the monster's island and attack and kill it. But that plot, that plan was devastatingly wrong. Lord Dalian is lost with all his men, including cattle. That's Act 1. So in Act 2, Corrin asks the king's blessing to go and kill the monster. The king reluctantly agrees and Corrin leaves on his terrifying quest. That night he's asleep and, and the query, fairy queen is summoned and asked to use her magical powers to help him. She visits him in his dreams and tells him that he must catch a kelpie if he's going to have any chance of success. She also leaves a lock of golden hair. Corn is going to need her help because I don't know if you all know what a Kelpie is, but it's a shape-shifting demon that lives in lochs and, and, and uh, the sea, and it appears on land as a horse and pony. If it's mounted, it jumps back into the sea, taking its victim to, to their death. Corn, armed with the Fairy Queen's magic, follows her advice and captures a Kelpie. But by, by using the magic to capture it, Corn realizes it's tormented and feeling guilty he lets it go again. The Kelpie, though, comes back freely to help him, and an unlikely friendship begins. Corrin and the Kelpie ride to Mr. Sturum's island. However, in the first encounter, Corrin is wounded, and the Kelpie has to carry him back to the shore. Before he, he loses consciousness, though, he tells Ula that he saw his father's sword on, on the island. In Act 3, Ula's grandmother's tending to Corrin and giving him a potion to drink to heal him. However, while he's unconscious, Ula has ridden the Kelpie back to the monster's island and retrieved his father's sword. Corn awakes, fully recovered, and is invigorated. He takes his father's sword and he rides back to fight the, uh, Mr. Sturman one final time and kills the monster. So that's the, the story in a nutshell, more or less anyway. Um, I'll give you some background now as to where we, how we got here. The project was originally a, a CD recording uh, that was done for my record label. Uh, the music 
it, it was done for narrator and orchestra. The music was by Savorna Stevenson and children's playwright Stuart Patterson wrote the story. Billy Boyd narrated the, 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 the recording and it was accompanied by the orchestra of, of Scottish opera. I uh, always well, thought it was great that we got Hobbit to do it, but uh, this is the, the recording. It's, it's been packaged in a, a CD-sized book, so it features a whole lot of little illustrations that were commissioned. But that's, that's where it started life. My background is the music industry, and I set up the first pop and rock music courses in Scotland many moons ago in an Edinburgh college. Uh, I've been involved with, with the Scottish Qualifications Authority, uh, for a long time, saw many of these changes. We, I, led, I led developments in music, sound production and music business. Uh, I was senior verifier for around 15 years. And while I worked at college, I also did, took students on cultural exchanges with partners in Holland, Russia and Italy. Uh, when I left college, I set up the records of music com uh, publishing companies and obviously Mr. Stewart was one of our projects. A few years ago, excuse me, just two seconds getting dry here. A few years ago, after an, e an email, I had the good fortune of meeting Gotchi Svetanovsky via Spike, uh, Skype. He is a Macedonian filmmaker and animator. Uh, Gotchi is now creative director of Lynx Animation, uh, the, the biggest animation house in the Balkans, and they're currently producing John Vardar versus the Galaxy, Macedonia's first feature length animation directed by Gotcha. Gotcha also created a children's animation web series, The World of Bibi. He's already had 15 million YouTube club clicks on that one. He's also uh, written a screenplay for, uh, for a feature length live action political thriller that's about to be filmed later this year. He's producer and director. Of course, that's COVID permitting. Uh, Anyway, uh, Gotcha and I hit off immediately. We're both passionate about fantasy and mythology. Uh, right from the outset, it was our dream to create an animation about Corn and Mr. Sturwell. We knew we'd have to expand the short story to include additional characters and dialogue, as well as various locations. So we have Skyped a lot over the years. Anyway, we eventually met face to face at MIFA at the Annecy Film Festival. Gotcha had pulled together a team in Macedonia to produce the project dossier, including an animation trailer, which you saw earlier, uh, illustrations of characters, key scenes, and storyboard. After a few false starts, we formed a comic graphic novels publishing company called Comic Brew. Uh, I think it was a wee cocktail. It's one part Macedonia and one part Scottish, although maybe Scotch would be a better way to put it, but as a drink. Uh, so where are we now? Well, the graphic novel Corn's Quest is currently in production in Macedonia with Gotchi overseeing the process. He's working with some excellent Macedonian artists and they are very, very good. Uh, we've had our ups and downs with the pro project and it's taken a few years to get to this point, but we're, we've almost got our first part of the dream done. To date, we've financed the project ourselves. All line art, drawings, lettering is complete, some 150 pages in all. Uh, but we still have to colour it. When complete, the graphic novel is obviously a product in its own right, but we also have it as a promotional tool. And with the line art done, it's actually a storyboard ready to roll. In terms of audience, it's clear that people have had a fascination with mythology and historical themes since the time of the Greeks, with books and films featuring monsters from myth. Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones are obvious examples of this. And the heroes of Scottish legend are numerous in film. However, the success of films featuring Scotland, such as Highlander, King Arthur, the animation Brave, as well as the TV series Outlander, demonstrate a wider interest in Scottish history and culture. The audience that enjoys these and similar films is the same target audience for a film version of Corn's Quest. Adam, I hate to do this, but we are out of time. We're out of time, right? Okay, that's fair enough. I've two seconds and that's it. I mean, it just welcome the opportunity to develop it, basically. So thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank that's you. Awesome recap. Thank you very thank much, you. Adam. Thanks, Adam. Okay, right. Bye, thank you. Okay then, thanks then, right? Bye. Bye. Hello. Hi. <laughs> just connecting, yep. Welcome Hi. to Before the Shelf panel. These are our panelists and on you go.
Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Anne from Cranachan Publishing. Uh, I'm based on Nile of Lewis in Outer Hebrides. If I could lift my monitor, you could see the Atlantic Ocean uh, out my window, but I'm not strong enough. Um, I'm going to pitch two YA titles to you today because we focus on high quality children's fiction and YA fiction. But please don't let the YA label put you off. Um, both of these books could absolutely uh, have been published as adult fiction. It's just that I focus very much on the schools market as my background is, is in education. So first up for you today, and I'm just going to set myself a wee timer. Please just uh, do this uh, if I start to run over. Um, first up today is Sunny and Me. This is by Ross Sayers. Um, we tend to describe it as still game meets the in-betweeners meets the dairy girls, except it's about two teenage boys uh, and it's set in Scotland. It's uh, written in Scots, it's set in um, present-day Stirling. It's a hilarious blend of banter, crime and comedy as well. And it has an inclusive cast of characters. Uh, we can see a hint there with our rainbow slushy. Um, the tagline is fourth year, two pals, one murder, welcome to Battlefield High. Our protagonists are Sonny uh, and his friend Billy. Uh, they're just trying to get through a uh, fourth year uh, at high school, if you like. So plenty of meat there in terms of it being a coming of age novel. Um, who's going to lose their virginity first? How's Sonny going to be able to confide in his friends that he's gay? Um, who's going to beat who up on the pitch after school. Um, but there's so much more to it than that. Really, this book is about the characters. It's about the relationship between Sunny and Billy. Sunny isn't the sharpest tool in the box, um, and Billy really takes him under his wing and tries to, to look out for him. So it's that relationship, that warmth, that loyalty uh, that sucks the reader in. One of the biggest strengths of the book is how it captures family life and growing up in Scotland today. There's a kind of nostalgia to the book, although it's set in present day Scotland. More than that still though, it's got all that going on, but it's actually a fully fledged and very clever uh, murder mystery uh, that pulls the plot along at pace as we go through. It's actually one of the teachers that is the murderer, major spoiler there for you, I'm afraid. Uh, but this uh, results in various escapades, various stakeouts and scrapes. Uh, one of the most memorable scenes is um, Billy, I will just say, shirting himself as he gives blood in the church town hall. Um, the whole thing culminates in a big reveal on the top of the school roof with Billy, Sonny, the teachers, the police, uh, where the murderer is unmasked. Uh, so it's essentially full of drama, perfect for the screen, big or small. Uh, and our readers do agree. I have some quotes uh, from our readers. Um, Sunny and Me would make a fabulous comedy film. The dialogue is sharp and consistently laugh out loud funny. I'd gladly have read nothing more than pages of the dialogue. Uh, my favourite quote is from Alistair Braidwood from Scots Way Hay. It's arguably the best Scottish coming of age novel since the seminal boy racers. It's funny, thrilling, entertaining, uh, vital and real. Um, Ross, as an author himself, this is his second novel. We, we published it only a year ago. His first novel came out in 2017. It was shortlisted for the Saltire First Book Award. Um, this one was the Scottish Book Trust Book of the Month when it came out in May 2019. Um, he's also written a sequel in case you are looking for series potential. But really to do uh, Ross justice, I'm really going to have to read you a tiny, tiny extract uh, for you just now. Uh, I'm not an actor, so please, please forgive me. <laughs> this takes place in the kitchen uh, in Billy's house. Where are you off to at this time? Dad asks, scrolling through the daily records on his tablet. Sonny and me are just going for a walk before school. A walk? Where? Just a walk. Mum sits down at the table where fruit's gone and opens her laptop to look at the mail website. 
human being, she says. It's just the way I walk. What if it's an orange walk? Dad says. What if your son is away on an orange walk? Is that all right with you, Alison? Oh, don't be ridiculous, Mum answers. It's half seven. Folk only been sectarian at this time of the morning. So if it's something you'd like to read, I'd be delighted to send you a, a copy as well. You can just let me know. That's book number one. How are we doing for time? I'm okay. You're doing, you're doing good. We have three more minutes, four more minutes. Okay. Quickly, quickly. This is Anna by Laura Duffy. It's a debut. I generally tell people it's like Eleanor Oliphant, if you enjoyed that, but with a younger protagonist uh, and, in my opinion, a better ending. Um, set in the late 90s in the fictional West Lothian town, uh, this life-affirming debut is actually it's a loose, modernised version of Eleanor H. Porter's Pollyanna, if you're familiar with that classic. This is actually due out this Thursday, due out, uh, on the 25th of June, we decided not to postpone. This is a book really for this time, it's about kindness, it's about humanity, it's about being glad, it's about looking on the bright side. Um, this book is going to be reviewed in the Scotsman on the 27th, it's going to the Scottish Book Trust Book of the, book of the Month next month and it made it onto various lists as well. Anna, the main uh, character, is 13 years old. She has Asperger's syndrome. Now, today that would actually be described as autism, but because this is set in the in 1990s, it's um, Asperger's at that point. We meet Anna on the bus. She's been living in London with her dad, the two of them together, but there's a house fire. Anna makes it out and her dad dies. So she's 13, she's alone on the bus, on her way to Scotland to go and try and live with her mum, who she hasn't seen really since she was a baby. This makes things really tough because Anna having Asperger's has difficulty in reading people and their emotions. And the mum also is extremely closed off emotionally, so it's really hard to get the two to connect. Now that might sound like it's not particularly appealing, but this book, I can assure you, is full of joy. It's full of humour. And much of that will come from Anna's perspective and simplicity on life. So, for example, they meet at what we believe is a random man in the neighbourhood. And the mum just happens to mention that he's got plenty of skeletons in his closet. And Anna believes that he actually has skeletons in his closet and he actually skins people alive. Um, we later discover uh, that it's actually Anna's granddad. And the book is a bit like that. The story drips out very gently. Um, and we discover that a lot of the characters that Anna's been meeting are actually very significant in her own life story. Um, unless you've read Pollyanna, the ending will hit you like a ton of bricks. I cried for half an hour, there is your warning. Um, Laura, although it's a debut novel, she has um, a PhD in creative writing. Um, and she has Asperger's herself, she uses a very safe pair of hands, if this is something you were interested in. When the book was published um, in America, they actually had things called, you can see us here, um, GLAD clubs started springing up all over America at the time, um, sort of to spread kindness, hope and positivity, and to encourage people to play the GLAD game or the happy game that Anna plays. So, if you want to become a member of the GLAD Club, I'll gladly send you a badge. And a book, of course. <laughs> okay, am I done? Did I make it? You're perfect. And that was just awesome. Thank you so much. And you know, if there's follow-up questions or things, we're really happy to connect you. You did a wonderful job. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, George. Hello. Hi. Hi, welcome to Before the Shelf. I'm Jessica, and this is our panel. And please go ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah, no worries. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm George Alexander. I'm the Assistant Managing Director of uh, Ringwood Publishing. And the two books that I'm going to uh, pitch today are Cuddy's Strip by Rob McEnroy and Not the Lice Imagined by uh, Anne Pettigrew. Uh, Cuddy's Strip is based on a true crime set in Perth in 1930s Scotland. 
It follows the investigation and subsequent trial of the crime, but it also examines uh, the morals of the time and the insensitive treatment of women in a male-dominated society. It's a novel about love and friendship and the need to break free from the ghosts of the past. Uh, Cuddy Strip is a very visual book, uh, set mainly in the beautiful countryside around Perth, uh, with some, some scenes like 1935 Perth, and the final court denouncement set in a grand Edinburgh uh, setting. It starts with two innocent young sweethearts walking home from the Cuddy Strip, a lover's lane in the outskirts of Perth. Suddenly from nowhere, two shots rang out, and 18-year-old Danny Kerrigan slumped to the ground, fatally wounded. His girlfriend, 17-year-old Marjorie Fenwick, flees, but is chased, caught, attacked, and assaulted, but then left injured and alive. The elderly police doctor who examines her after the attack casts doubt on her claims to have been uh, uh, innocent to the crime, questioning her veracity and her morality, and this is seen by many to damage her credibility as a witness. The local rural, rural, uh, rural police force, with many ignorant and bigoted old school police officers, treats her with suspicion and makes hard work of an investigation with no leads. It takes the combined efforts of the only two policemen to believe and support her, an old inspector and a, non, a new young police constable, to conduct a dogged and determined investigation using persistence and modern policing methods to painstakingly pursue the offender and catch him just before he's about to strike again. However, while this is a big part of the story, the focus is on the barrier set out against Marjorie and how she combats a system that is set up against her. Marjorie's ordeal is not over with her attacker's arrest. She's subjected to another court-ordered humiliating medical, and the trial itself is a further ordeal with the prominent judge casting more doubts on her veracity, morality, and credibility as a witness and affecting the verdict of the jury. While Cuddy Strip is at one level a highly absorbing period piece from 1930 Scotland, this story has strong contemporary resonances, both about the nature and responsiveness of police services and the ingrained misogyny of the whole criminal justice system. It's also the first novel by Scottish writer Rob McEnroy, who's won several prestigious prizes for his short stories uh, over the past few years, and we're very uh, pleased to be publishing it. And then uh, for the second novel that I'm pitching today, it's uh, Not the Life Imagined by Anne Pettigrew, which is a darkly humorous, thought-provoking story of Scottish medical student students in the 60s, a time of changing so social and sexual mores. None of the teenagers starting at Glasgow University in 1967 lived the life they imagined. Beth Slater is shocked at how few female medical students there are and that some people such as Connor, Tomway, think they shouldn't be there at all. Devastated by a close friend's suicide, Beth uncovers a revealing diary and vows to find the person responsible for her death. Struggling with the pressures of exams while supporting friends through disaster, Beth charts the student's changing, often stormy relationship over two decades and a contemporary backdrop of free love, the Ibrox football disaster, the emergence of HIV and DNA forensics. In time, indiscretions surface with dire consequences for some. And not the life imagined, we have retired medic Anne Pettigrew, the author of the story. She's written a tale of ambition and prejudice laced with sharp observations, irony, and powerful perceptions that provide a humorous and compelling insight into the complex dynamics of the NHS 50 years ago. It's also a book that's done very well in sales and continues to resonate with her readers, continually being one of our best-selling books. She also has a spiritual successor to the book called Not the Deaths Imagined, which is coming out later this year and also looks at simil similar talk topics, but focuses on uh, more like the systematic oppression that women go through in the medical services. And uh, we're also, again, very happy to do that. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, the... Yeah, I don't think I have any more to say about that unless anyone has any questions about either of the books. No, they're very timely, though. Good, great. I know. I know. I think I got back through that a bit quicker than I was thinking. That's yeah. right. They're very good, though. Good, yeah. good, good synopses. <clears throat> uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, George, thank you very, very much. That was excellent and most probably articulate and concise pitch mm -hmm. we've had so far. So thank mm -hmm. you. That's brilliant. Yeah, but you know, I'm not, I'm not a great like uh, coming off the top of my head, so I'm better writing it down. No, it's honest. awesome. It's also <laughs> really good. Yeah. yeah if really there's good. any any follow up questions, we can connect you guys definitely. Grant, all right. Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, thank you. Look forward to hear back here. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. George. Hi, Andrea. Hi.
Hi. Hi. Well, Hello. welcome to the Expo Hello. North um, Before the Shelf. This is our panel. And oh, I don't want to interrupt your 10 minutes. So on no, you go, go for it. Fine. Gosh, there were so many of you. I wasn't expecting that, but that's great. Um, okay. Well, um, I've got three novels to tell you about. Um, the first one is called Firebird and it's by Susan Sellers and it's about, um, it's really the story of a love affair between uh, Lydia Lipakova, who is a Russian ballerina who danced uh, the Ballet Russe with Diaghilev, she, she danced with Stravinsky, and John Maynard Keynes, a uh, brilliant economist, sort of very uh, huge intellectual, um, who also actually financed the Bloomsbury set. Um, and they are, they're a very unlikely couple. Um, Maynard Keynes saw, the, the novel opens in uh, 1921, uh, Maynard Keynes goes to see Firebird. Firebird is a, a ballet put on by Diaghilev, which uh, was sort of Lydia's um, signature, almost famous dance. Um, and uh, he sees her, he essentially falls in love uh, with her which is even more surprising because up until then, he's in his 40s, he's been gay. Uh, he has had an affair with Duncan Grant, who also subsequently had an, it was a brilliant, rather beautiful painter, who also subsequently had an affair with Vanessa Bell, Virginia Woolf's sister, um, and had a child with her. So this was sort of the plot thickens. Um, the first section of the book is about the Bloomsbury set and how extremely chilly they are towards Lydia, um, who they consider to be quite kind of vulgar, uh, obsessed with money, um, although they're actually quite obsessed with money as well. Uh, it turns out that essentially, and they do everything they possibly can to prevent this marriage taking place. Um, they're an amazing, the couple themselves are just you know they have an amazing relationship it's it's uh, opposites attract and it's kind of really delightful and Lydia is an absolutely fantastic character I think that's the sort of the main theme that runs through it so I'm not timing myself do give me a tell me if I'm going on too long um she's been supporting herself since she was 14 she from the age of eight was dancing in the Tsar's ballet school so that the first section is very much is set in London. It's set in this bohemian world, bohemian yet rather chilly world. It turns out actually that um, Duncan Grant is Maynard Keynes's heir, and so his daughter with Vanessa is also Maynard Keynes's heir. So there's a sort of financial thing running through it as to why they want to prevent this marriage. The second section of the book, Act Two. It uh, takes place in St. Petersburg, in um, Paris. Um, St. Petersburg, it's, it's uh, Lydia's early life. Uh, she goes and dances in Paris, and then she's kind of lured off to America, where she, she goes off and she makes a huge amount of money, and she has a great deal of success. She has an affair with Stravinsky. She has a miscarriage at a certain point. She gets married. She doesn't really dance ballet. She sort of becomes a kind of actress, show person, celebrity, um, but very much her own woman and you, her, you sort of learn about her personality. She ends up back in London again with this um, uh, the, the Bloomsbury set trying to uh, prevent the marriage, but they do get married. It, it is a happy story and uh, they have an incredible relationship. They're an amazing sort of there are great set pieces. There's sort of wonderful bits when they move into um, Vanessa Bell's old uh, house in Gordon Square. They all live together. I mean, the, the sort of cast of characters is huge. There's, I mean, she also is painted by Pablo Picasso. So there's a whole section of Pablo Picasso in Paris where she's much more in with Picasso and it's sort of the tables are slightly turned because Virginia Woolf and Clive Bell are all trying to get in with him. But yeah, so it's very much about sort of snobbery and sort of social maneuvering as well. There's a wonderful scene in London when they paint 
over the murals that uh, Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell have done in their house. And they, uh, Lydia and Maynard whitewashed them and uh, spattered in paint. And um, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of sort of very, you know, wonderful scenes like that. Lots of, of Lydia dancing Firebird. Um, uh, the terrible snobbery, like at one point she's staying in a country house and she has her period and she tries to get her blood-stained pants burnt by the valet in the grate. And this is discovered and, and held up for mockery um, and recounted by Virginia Woolf very unkindly to everybody. Um, so yeah, that, this is really the story. It's um, I, I think it would make, an, well, I don't know, I, I think it's very visual, I think it would be amazing. It's an amazing story. It's kind of true, I mean, it is true, essentially. It's very well researched. Um, everything in it happened. All the characters are real. Obviously not every conversation is real, but a lot of them are. A lot of, she discovered a lot of uh, letters between Keynes and Lydia. Um, and she's done quite, really a lot of research. So there's, a, there's sort of lots of um, aspects about Lydia's relationship with, especially with Virginia Woolf, which, which, are, which are true. Um, they all come round to her in the end, hooray, <laughs> as they should, because she's a person of great charm and energy. Um, so yeah, that's one. <laughs> I don't know if that makes it. Do you have any questions or, sh or shall I? Uh, it's a like great it? story. It's a great story. I mean, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you, I think you might, it's good to say you might be best getting through the other two just because mm -hmm. of your, your time. Always through, yeah, always through. You have, you have, Andrea, you have about four minutes. Just I've got four know. minutes. I'll be really quick. Right, the second one, completely different, is called Bitter Hall. It's contemporary. It's set in uh, Edinburgh. Edinburgh is kind of um, like a big character in it. It's got a real sort of sense of sort of brooding Gothic Edinburgh. Um, okay, sort of one line pitch. It's got a sort of shallow grave meets Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets but for adults. So it's a kind of uh, folie à toi. It uh, starts off in a big old house. There are three uh, uh, flatmates or two flatmates and a girlfriend. And the three of them have this, it's narrated by each of the three characters. Uh, a diary is found. Uh, one of the characters, Tom, so it's Tom, Daniel and Orla. Tom is very, very beautiful. Daniel's in love with Tom. All is in love with Tom, everyone's in love with Tom. Um, and uh, Tom basically becomes possessed by the writer of the diary. So it's at the same time incredibly contemporary. Um, Daniel works in a, a, a 3D printing research lab. There's a lot about true, what's real, what's fake. Orla is a graduate student. She works with ancient manuscripts, looking at like the Book of Kells, looking at little doodles drawn in the in the side. And Tom has a dreadful job in marketing. Um, there's the denouement takes place in this amazing modernist house on Halloween, a party at Halloween, uh, when they all end up, uh, as you'd expect, both possessed and in bed with each other. Um, and there is more, but. It's two minutes, so <laughs> um, yeah. So again, I uh, totally different. I think the sort of thing there is this brooding sense of place, and these, the, the, the three kind of events coming up, narrated by three different people, and the idea that it's both very contemporary, very modern, but really, really gothic and really creepy, and it is actually really scary. The kind of possession bits are really frightening. The looking in the mirror and seeing somebody else there, and yeah, scrabbling. Yeah. It's by Helen McClory, who's an amazing writer. Um, it's her second novel. She's done some short stories as well. Right. The last one is any comments on that? Oh, can you remind great. Me the yeah, can you remind me the title? Yeah, it's called Bitter Hall. Bitter. Yes. Bitter Hall is where James Lennox Love, who may or may not be the writer of the diary, apparently lives. But then it nothing is true, everything is fake or not, or you find out. So there's lots and lots of twists and turns down that route. Andrea, um, I'm very sorry to be the person to say this to you as well, but uh, for the last book, if we can get a 30 minute super pitch. Right, okay. Last book, okay. This is, 
also a period piece. This is set in Glasgow and Shanghai. It's based on the life of one of the Glasgow girls painters. Um, it's actually two young women, starts off before the war, one of them goes to become a painter, one becomes a dancer, and it's basically tracing their lives through um, marriages, moving to Shanghai as a, a sort of doctor's wife, again it's based on, I'm trying to, I can't remember the, the name of the, or the painter she's based on, but, and it is called Daisy Chain, and, okay, uh, anyway, I can't remember the name of the uh, painter it's, it's based on, but yeah, basically it's, um, I can't really say more. There's lots of plot and I think the thing about this one is the woman's story and there's loads and loads of plot and there's loads of twists and turns. And again, it feels very modern, very contemporary, but it's, I mean, it's not, but it is very much about being an artist, finding your way. Um, more commercially written, I'd say. It's quite long, a lot of plot, a lot of things happen. Uh, yeah. That's Thanks great. That is heroic. <laughs> that was great. Heroic, yeah. You went oh. from, from John Maynard Keynes and Bloomsbury to Gothic to Shanghai. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Is that it? Any questions? So, okay. Great. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> we now have Alan from Little Door. Lots of people. Yeah, <laughs> welcome to the Before the Shelf pitch panel. Go ahead. The floor is all Go yours. Ahead. I will. Uh, now for something completely different, uh, I'm sure. Uh, I am a children's publisher, Little Door Books. We're an award-winning children's publisher, actually. Uh, and I'm an author as well. And I want to pitch to you uh, one of our picture books. I'm probably not able to share anything. I'm, I'm able to share something very briefly. Oh, so it, uh, da, 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 da. I don't know if that'll happen or not. Anyway, what I'll do you is actually I'll just go through. Uh, right, should I just click on the... Da, 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 da. Right, uh, here we go. Basically, I, I don't know if you can see that, guys. Um, yep. I'm yeah. Alan, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're at the side as well. Hi. Uh, Alan and Wendron Little Door Books, as I said. Uh, we're a small picture book publishing company, but we've had really a lot of uptake on uh, this picture book, One Button Benny. Benny won the picture book prize 2019, where 60,000 children uh, from all over Scotland and families got a copy of this book and chose the winner. Um, so the picture book has actually been in over 60,000 homes just in Scotland itself. And it's uh, recently been translated into Russian, Chinese, Slovenian, Korean, Arabic. And um, it's um, basically getting all over the world. And uh, we're really interested in, in animation. Uh, we've been speaking to, I spoke to Jackie Edwards down at uh, CC, uh, the, the children's conference, and she was really interested in doing it, but she was just moving over to the BFI. We've been speaking to Julia Bond as well, who was really interested too, but she said to try and tie in with producers and other animation companies. And uh, basically we're really um, trying to get things on. Hopster have taken on a non-exclusive with uh, uh, um, uh, ebook and uh, Jack Loudon. I don't know if anybody knows the actor Jack Loudon, who's been in a lot of uh, Hollywood films, Long Song and War and Peace and Mary Queen of Scots. He read the audiobook for the first book as well, and uh, there are original songs that have been written for it as well. And the um, sequel is out in August, so I'm really just trying to get a bit of a handle on what you guys do and possibilities for animation. We've been speaking to a couple of animation companies as well. We're really just trying to, to find out what a next step might be or if there's any interest in animation. I know that things are changing at the moment because of the coronavirus and live action and things. So I was really just too interested to see what you thought. Uh, <laughs> But uh, basically, we're kind of just pitching the one book just now because that has had most interaction. We've got 18 picture books that have been published and they all have elements of amazing illustration. We try to work with brand new illustrators that have something that uh, can expand to a different sort of platform. So that's why we're looking at different things. I'm dying to know what happens when you press Benny's button. We'll just have to read it and see. <laughs> Now, various things happen. Basically, every time Benny presses his button, he gets what he needs for that situation rather than necessarily what he wants. 
basically he, he managed to solve a big problem with all the, the aliens, but the next book has got another adventure as well. So, um, yeah. It's a very Any good other? concept. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds great fun, Alan. Um, just for um, as the BBC commissioner, the children's division sits slightly with where, where we are, so you'd probably want to be speaking to CBBC about about that. For for me, I'm more in the the adult space for commissioning scripted. And sure. Yeah. Um, but if you dive into the website, um, the CBBC commissioning website, that will give you some ideas of approaches. But you probably want to partner with a production company to try and make that. Uh, approach, but they, they're always looking for IP and ideas in, in that space. Animation tends to be a multi-funded yeah. thing just because of the scale of it, but, um, but and using international partners to pull it together, but definitely worth exploring. Yeah. When I spoke to Jackie at CCM, she was really, like, even after she joined the BFI, she said, I would definitely look favorably to this because she remembered the whole book a year later and I had five minutes to talk to her. So I think even just that sort of thing, it's kind of stuck in her head a little, uh, the whole uh, character and things. But yeah, I was really interested to, to see what you guys thought and uh, if you had any pointers to people or anything like that. I'll, I'll try and think of a few people also. I just remember I used to work for the Walt Disney Company and I used to meet with animators in Bologna at the Bologna Book Fair. There are a lot of people in Italy who do that. Right. Um, okay. So I'll try and think of some of the Italian companies who can That'd be super, that Lola. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Jess and Jenny will be able to pass on my details. Yeah. 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 The other place you should, you should look at if you haven't already looked at um, is Passion Pictures. They're based in London and Soho and very, very prominent in animation um, and commercials and stories and short forms. And they're always looking for new illustrators That's that's with, and storytellers. So have you looked at them or met them, passion pictures? No, no, not as yet. Like one of the things we try to do with Little Door Books as well is to work with new graduate illustrators to get people mm -hmm. into the industry because it's so hard for them to get a first leg on the, on the ladder. So we try and pair them up with yeah. known authors so that they're getting a real exposure to, so pretty much most of our picture books, we try to put uh, named authors with new illustrators. So we really try to encourage new people in. And Chloe was a brand new illustrator, worked in a cafe uh, who did the uh, Benny <laughs> illustrations. So uh, it's, it's really quite amazing. <laughs> Great. Well, we can set that introduction up, can't we? Look, we can do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. That would be mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. But if you think of anything, please do uh, email me. Uh, the the yeah. stuff's there. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that's me out of time <laughs> by now. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Thanks very great. much for inviting me. Great. Thank thanks you. for your time. Great fun. Thank you. Be your time. Thank you. Bye bye. And the last but not least, we have Robbie from Kate Nash um, Literature, I think, Kate Nash Literary Agency. Hi, Robbie. Hello. Hi, welcome to Before the Shelf. Um, this is your pitch panel, and Hello. I won't take any of your time, so go ahead, go for it. Goodness, okay, hopefully it will stick with it. Um, yes. Uh, thanks very much for meeting with me. Um, on this uh, Monday afternoon. You're probably all a bit tired um, and have done lots of these already. I represent the Kate Nash Literary Agency and I have four titles that I'm going to try uh, to go through very quickly indeed. Um, two of them are sort of uh, series suggestions and two are maybe something that could be a little bit bigger. Um, first up, this is Face by Joma West. Joma is an author um, living in Glasgow. This is her first novel. It hasn't been published yet, but um, I was hoping that I'd be able to say something else today, but uh, the news hasn't quite come through yet. So um, Face is a science fiction domestic suspense uh, that plays out in a world where touch has become taboo. So it's something that, um, though she wasn't writing it uh, during coronavirus, it's something that's become quite prescient um, as, as things have gone on. Uh, ambitious in scope but manageable in scale, it's the perfect watching for fans of Parasite, Black Mirror and Years and Years. Um, it's got a really strong cast of characters and a really tight claustrophobic storyline where one touch shatters the perfect family. Um, so it's set in this world where 
you don't touch one another. Even babies are sort of designed and made off screen, as it were, and then they're sort of presented to you. Um, and what happens is the, it's, it's the family in question is an incredibly successful one, an incredibly wealthy one. Um, and there is a, a moment that shatters this pretense. And we soon find out that all the different members of the family are, um, uh, nothing is quite as uh, serene as it seems. Um, it's really beautifully written. I could see it being um, sort of a... So we heard, we heard um, everything is not what it seems with this family. Oh, right. Okay. Um, yes, everything is not quite what it seems with this family. Um, get my notes to the right position. Um, you've got, uh, yeah, the sort of the parents and the children, and they seem to be, um, they seem to have the perfect face, but uh, everything goes um, uh, one touch and suddenly everything is shattered. And you see this from seven different perspectives um, through the book. You see it from their two children, um, from the mother and the father, Skylar and Madeline, and from their menial, um, which is sort of like a, a servant. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really claustrophobic, um, really suspenseful, and yeah, I, I love it. I love this book so much. <laughs> Great. I'm going to I'm going to jump forward because I'm realizing that I'm I'm losing time with the pauses in the connection. Um, so I thought I'd talk to you now about Faith Martin, who is the author of the Hillary Green novels. Um, she is published by HarperCollins, and they've sold over a million copies in the last uh, three years. I think um, she is well loved, mostly. Um, through an ebook audience, but uh, nonetheless, they're all really strong readers. Um, so this series is based around Hilary Green, who is a detective set in Oxfordshire. Um, she lives on a narrow boat, and it's sort of, uh, I guess, the closest I would sort of bring it to is um, Midsummer Murders, probably. Um, it's mm. a really uh, great, twisty crime novel which have yeah lots of twists and turns lots of um great characters sort of coming on and off and come returning again throughout the series um so she's currently written 18 books in that series um and she's also got a uh, a mystery series also published by harper collins that is set in the 60s as well if you're looking for something a little bit uh more period I guess. Great. Oh, gosh, it's very mm -hmm. successful. Yeah, she's done, she's done incredibly well. Um, and she'd sort of, we'd had this back catalogue. Um, she came to us with this back catalogue about four years ago. And yeah, and, and somebody just saw it and loved it. And luckily readers have done as well. It's great. Um, Thank you. Okay, and now the next two are... Yeah, set slightly further afield. Um, the first is a, an historical novel by Andy Newton. Um, this is called The Girls from Utah Beach. And it's based on true events, though she's um, pushed them uh, quite far, I would have to say. Um, the main characters are four nurses, four American nurses who land just after the Normandy invasion. Um, and have set up base on, um, on Utah Beach. And they are asked to go out to a village where there are some um, special service soldiers who have been sort of holed up to, to patch them up because they've been in a fight. Um, and they go out there, but an easy mission quickly turns sour and they, um, they find out that they've been betrayed and they're suddenly behind enemy lines and separated and they have to sort of get back, um, get back home again. Um, and there is some possible sort of, uh, uh, sorry, lost my place in my notes. Yes, um, the, the secret, the detachment of soldiers that they went out to um, patch up, it turns out 
have stolen quite a large amount of jewels um, that they are trying to, to smuggle out. There's Gestapo who know that, they're, that they've got the jewels and they're after them. And the nurses are sort of stuck uh, feeling betrayed and uh, their mission forces them to overcome their differences to each other. And they have to decide what they have to, um, blimey, they have to decide what they are prepared to risk and what they have to live for. Um, Andy Newton has got one other uh, novel out at the moment um, called uh, The Girl I Left Behind. And that is set in France as well during the Second World War. And she's published by Aria, which is um, part of the Head of Zeus family. And last up, with my last two minutes, I have um, Alex Shaw, the author Alex Shaw, has got a new thriller series out with HarperCollins coming out this year. Um, he's aiming it to be sort of the new Jack Reacher. Um, he wants to be the new Lee Child. Um, and this is uh, headed up by a British spy, Jack Tate. Um, and in uh, the first novel, uh, what happens is Jack Tate is on a road trip through America and um, there is a secret uh, plot to destabilize America by setting off an EMP device. Um, the M EMP device is set off and Jack Tate has to fight his way back across America to Washington um, to try and save his brother in the embassy there. Um, and it's full of uh, Russian assassins, Spetsnaz commandos, attack helicopters, Chinese operated jets. It's probably quite big budget has to be said, but, uh, but it's a thrilling read, an absolutely thrilling read. What's, this, what's the time period, did you say? I, did um, I miss that? It's modern day, it's set in it, the modern it's day. It's contemporary. Yeah, okay. so the, the baddie is um, an ex-Russian uh, um, special forces officer with grievances, and he has teamed up with a, uh, a Chinese billionaire, I believe, to use um, some sort of Cold War software to create this EMP bomb. Um, and he basically wants revenge. He wants to, to knock the US off the, the pedestal of being the number one superpower. That's pretty good. Yeah. So there we go. Sorry, I've got a bit flustered in all that. No, it's great. It's oh, it did really great. Did a great job, <laughs> and they're great books. Robbie, we could give you an extra couple of minutes in case people have questions. I'm um, just trying to think. Um, or, um, sorry, just on the Hillary Green novels, are they, yes. um, I mean, they're so successful. Has, has anyone tried to option them before? Um, no, it's not something that we have um, been really pushing at the moment. We, are, mm -hmm. we only recently at the agency um, took on a new film and TV um, oh. sub-agent. So it's not something okay. that's sort of been out a huge um, amount. Would you call it, is it kind of cozy crime or is it a little bit beyond that? I think it's more cozy, definitely more cozy. cozy. Crime. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't know if Faith would, yeah, no, yeah. Faith would definitely say that it was cozy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, those are very popular. Yeah. And is Girls on Utah Beach published yet? It's coming out um, this year. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you the date. Okay. I should have had it written down. That's all right. Yeah. Well, I'm speaking as someone who actually passed on Lee Child 20 years ago, so <laughs> I'm just I'm never going to no get way. it for the rest of my life. But yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. Wasn't my proudest moment, but never yeah. mind. There's always one that got away, right? Yeah, I went with Andy McNabb instead, and where is he today? Never mind. No. <laughs> well, here's your second chance, Lola. <laughs> I know. Never mind. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, is the yeah, Alex Shaw? That that's exciting. that's not out yet, right? That's not out yet. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, cool. Thanks very much. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. Very much. Thanks, Robbie. Thank Cheers. Thank you.